Before I go into corn rootworm and show you the roots, the larvae, the adults, um, I always start by saying a little bit about IPM. So Daryl Denneke is our IPM god. He coordinates all of the IPM efforts, but then all of us, you know, the disciplines within the agronomy, uh, pathology, entomology, weed science, we have uh, our programs focused on integrated pest management of our specific pest. For us, it's insect. And integrated pest management is about integrating different management tax tactics in managing insect. That means not relying on one single strategy and just diversifying a little bit. And I think we are seeing now um, uh, good reasons around us here in South Dakota and our neighbors why that is a good strategy to go. So integrated pest management is not about having a plan for this year or for next year, or two years from now. It's about thinking five years from now or 10 years from now. How are we going to integrate things and, and make, uh, make our uh, technologies last longer? So what we worry about with insects always is insecticide resistance development, okay? That is, a, that is a doozy and that happens without fail with basically everything we have. And it's going to happen. And, and IPM is all about doing things in such a way that we slow it down. We respect technologies that are available to make them last longer, okay? So what we're seeing right now with corn rootworm and uh, BT performance uh, issues or unexpected damage to BT fields is a good, good example of that, okay? So before, before we go into that, um, I just wanna mention um, BT traits for the uh, Lepidopteran pest, European corn borer. Any issues that you've seen or heard of or experienced? Nope, nope. What about corn rootworm? Seen some lodging? Seen some damage? Lots of beetles in the south. In the south? Great. That's, I love to hear that. I know it's bad news for you, but I always love to hear that part. So last year was tremendous for the beetles. Last year we had a ton of them. Uh, there was a lot of lodging and actually there would have been more lodging. The conditions were dry. That affects their um, uh, uh, survival because there's not enough biota in the soil when it's dry fungi to attack them. So they did pretty well. We had some huge BT failures. Lots of them were emerging clipping silks. So a lot of people were actually spraying for beetles too. Last year was tremendous for them. This year, not so much, okay? I think we would have seen much more lodging last year. We had more wind events because there are so many beetles. We just didn't have enough wind events. So even if the roots were pretty damaged, they, the corn still stood and whatever yield drag there was because of the beetles, it was dry, so it was difficult to separate. Is it really beetle or is it just dry weather? So beetles, the, the BT trades with um, uh, rootworm uh, traits are a little different than the European corn borer. So why is that? Why the BT corn for, for European corn borer still stands strong and, and nothing's affecting it and there's no re indication that we'll have issues? So BT comes from the soil. It's a it, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a, bac, it's a bacterium that lives in the soil, occurs naturally, and it has a lot of toxins specific to different insects. So we figured those out and different companies put them in different parts of the plant and uh, marketed those traits. So what we have with uh, Lepidopteran traits, those toxins are expressed, you know, where the European corn borer feeds, the kernels, you know, it's a high expressing plant parts. Plant Plants naturally express a lot of proteins in those parts. So that's a big you know, dose of, insectic of uh, this insecticidal protein, basically. It's a high dose, we like that. We knock them out, they're gone. And there's something about biology of these insects too. They, they mate without much preference and their refuges are working nice. So there's no issues with, with uh, European corn borer resistance to Bt. The corn worm is a different story. So the corn, the plant roots don't, don't express that many proteins naturally. So that dose of toxin is low. So what that means, you know, whenever you go to the doctor and you're supposed to take your anti antibiotics, you're supposed to take full dose and you're supposed to take it all the way. Because if you don't, you're going to have some bacteria uh, uh, surviving and the development of resistance is going to be that much faster. So that's a, you know, that's basically same principle, same idea. So what we're seeing with the corn rootworm actually um, and you guys saw it last year. How long were the beetles emerging for? How long were the adults flying? Two, three weeks? Seven, eight, all the way through harvest? 
So last year was tremendously long emergence time. And that was because even if that toxin isn't killing them, and we still have some BT uh, hybrids that are working very well in South Dakota, it was actually slowing down their development. So what we see is, uh, I'm gonna pass this around. This vial comes from, these are, if you've never seen larvae, you've never dug out um, roots and soil and floated the larvae. This vial has BT, uh, that's cornworm um, larvae that came out from one plot, same BT variety. And they actually have, same, were dug out at the same time too, okay? So this is, this is all of the population stages that were present at the same time in those fields. And you can see first star, first instar larvae. Instar is just a stage of their development. So the teeny tiny skinny things, second and third instar, they were all present at the same time. So if you have this wide range of um, different stages, that means they're going to be developing and emerging uh, at different and very long, prolonged periods of time too. So that makes scouting for them really difficult. This year we have not, have you guys had any silk clipping um, issues in your fields with the cornwall worms? Are you seeing them even yet? They're coming out, but the numbers are uh, much, much lower than last year. I have some adults here too. These are westerns. So we had, uh, um, we had tremendously long periods of emergence last year and might not be as long this year just because it's been a little, it's been a little more difficult for the beetles this year. It's been wetter. Okay, these guys don't like it too wet when they're first hatching, but you know, they might just drown in some of those fields, too much moisture, fungal diseases, they don't like that too much. Uh, and uh, it's been much cooler, okay, so some egg desiccation possibly because the, the um, winter was so, was so incredibly dry. So to, the eggs are pretty hardy, but you know, too much desiccation will, will do them in too. So that's what the larvae look like. And um, I'm sure you have seen some versions of this in one way or another. So that's a, that's a nice root that's still holding up, right? And this is, this is the number that these larvae can do on a root plant, okay? So we, uh, sometimes you will see goosenecking and sometimes you'll just come in and it's just gonna be all down. So I wanna just point out in this eaten root, there's some little white roots right here. And that's because the roots have started to regrow. Um, so the plant will do what it can to make up for this loss for the for these eaten roots. So we'll, it will put out roots if it's if it can put out roots. It will it will try to compensate a little bit. So the damage we will see, you know, lodged corn cannot be harvested, and that's an issue. And uh, uh, I haven't had too many reports in South Dakota yet. I just heard about one field in white. I'm going to look at um, this week later on. But sometimes, you know, the corn will still stand, but if the, um, if the worms are feeding on the roots, what you're going to have is you're going to have slower uptake of nutrients and there's still going to be effect on yield. So even if it doesn't lodge, the worms are doing a number in terms of yield um, anyway. So the, the worms are passed on, I passed on the adults there. These are the westerns. And uh, this is the predominant species. And when we see BT failures in the fields, um, these are the guys that are coming out of those fields, okay? And uh, this country, however, has been home to another rootworm, right? The northern. the northern one. So what are you guys seeing in the last 10 years in terms of population changes? Does they ain't come in yet? It's usually about this time of year when they start showing up. So we had in our plots, I have um, experimental plots all the way up and down eastern South Dakota, and we have these emergence traps in our plot. So we have empty, empty bottoms and a little tent, and we capture whatever comes of the soil. So my four sites, uh, so far we had only two northern beetles come out of them, and this was all refuge, too. So predominantly north, uh, westerns, predominantly western beetles. And these are the ones that they're really good competitors uh, and uh, they've, you know, overcome uh, the BT. Um, uh, in some cases, some BT uh, toxins developed resistance and it's been con confirmed in other places in, in Midwest too. So one thing I wanted to mention, thank you, that some, sometimes we will see the um, 
unexpected damage of these beetles to corn, to Bt corn, because they've developed resistance. What that means, it's a heritable trait. These beetles and the offspring of these beetles have that trait for resistance. But sometimes they will damage the plants just because there's so darn many of them. So it's death by a million razors, you know, when you have millions of these things and they only feed for a short period of time each and then they die, they can still decimate the plant. So that's something that uh, um, is, sort of takes a long time to, to tease apart, which one is that, right? So we're still working on that. So Westerns and Northerns, um, and this is how you know you get to develop a little bit of respect for your enemy there, because they both uh, evolved really cool ways to overcome our rotation schedule. So people used to go beans, corn, beans, corn to, 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 to take care of them. And way back when, before BT, for rootworms, we had mostly northerns here, and everybody worried about um, uh, Bt because the northerns developed this extended diapause. So that these beetles will lay eggs um, in the field, uh, in the cornfield when they're emerging, and then you're rotating to, to soybeans and thinking you're taking care of the issue. But what these guys will do is stay in an egg form another year until you put corn back in that field. But that does not seem to be a problem for us because westerns are displacing the northerns and it just, uh, most of South Dakota right now, especially where I'm surveying, what, I've, what I'm hearing is becoming westerns, not northerns. Westerns do another cool thing, but that population is very limited in range. That population is west, uh, is east Iowa actually. What these guys will do is lay eggs in soybean fields, okay? And that is, that is tricky and that topples a lot of our management um, plans if that, if that population spreads out or if it's here. So if you ever see, hear, or witness first year cornfield that has rootworm damage, I would love to hear about that because they don't have them in Minnesota, they don't have them in Nebraska, it's just that eastern Iowa spot where they are. And I think some Illinois, but I'm not certain. Um, so it's really limited range, but we'd like to know if it, if it's, if it spreads out to here because that's very important. So what do we do about these guys? So I started by, t by telling you that we are into developing long range plants and thinking about long range management of these insects. So scientists all over Midwest are concerned with us. And we, uh, we had a conference in October last year and um, we came up with um, a couple things. First of all, what is a high risk field? When should you start thinking and worrying about potential worm issues and developing a plan? And second, what that plan should be. Uh, long-term integrated management plan. And the first thing we sort of developed are um, characteristics of a high-risk field. So which fields need to be looked at closely? And that would be a field that has had um, continuous corn at least three years, use the same BT hybrid, and if there is evidence for high numbers of beetles in that field the summer before. So when you, when you have all these three and uh, uh, some people try, you know, even play it safe and, and go with just the two first, first characteristics um, without even high beetle population, you know, that might put you in the high risk category for, for uh, corn worm issues. So what to do? So these things, uh, uh, it's sort of easier for us than some places down south because we have only one generation here, okay? So they lay eggs in uh, late summer, midsummer, late summer, depending on when these things emerge and how they, these things emerge for these days. And then the eggs over, over, over winter and they hatch in the spring and they start their, their damage in the spring and then they come out and that's, that's a full cycle, right? So we have only one generation and these things depend on corn. They cannot survive with corn without corn, okay? And it's not like they can travel far after they hatch. You see how tiny they are. They're incredibly susceptible to abrasion and dry conditions. So dry, sandy soils cause abrasion. They desiccate and die. Too much soil moisture, you know, that is a lot of fungi, uh, fungi natural enemies in the soil microbes, you know, that might be damaging to them too, okay? And then it's not like they are hardy. They can't walk even 10 feet, you know, out there, 15, 20 feet, you know, I think in meters, not feet. So they can't walk 20 meters to a field from another field to find corn roots. So you eliminate corn, you eliminate corn rootworm basically. So we developed this five year plan that includes four years of corn, okay? But you have to rotate and we're mixing rotating crops with mixing rotating chemistries and, and pesticide use. The first year, 
you gotta you gotta switch to something else from corn. You just you just have to. So soybeans are wonderful. We can grow soybeans here, and it's a profitable crop too. So switching to soybean year one, year two, you've gotten rid of your rootworms um, and whatever laid eggs in there, you know, didn't survive. So you're safe. You can go to BT, non-BT corn next year. Now I, I usually get laughs when I say that because. You know, who's going to do it? And are you going to get enough seeds? But, you know, really, the demand drives the, the, um, the supply. So second year, you can go non-BT. You're going to be safe. Third year, uh, non-BT still, but with soil applied insecticides. OK, so you're, there's, there's going to be beetles laying eggs in that, in that corn the year before. So putting soil insecticide, that makes sense. Now, what kind is it, you know, should you go with um, uh, granular or, or liquid. That sort of depends a little bit on, on the soil types. I hear some people in Nebraska and different regions of Nebraska have different luck with different types of pesticides. And what we're doing our trials this year, we have, we're sampling our producers fields outside of our plot. So we have some data on that too that uh, we, I'll be able to put it together by the end of the season and see how they held up. Fourth year, you can start your BT uh, corn, and uh, fourth and fifth year, both BT corn years, and we prefer um, uh, stacked uh, trades to single trades. It's always better, and uh, uh, alternating if possible. But we don't have that many different kinds to choose from, so I always worry about overusing the same things. And there's a lot of uh, um, there's a lot of potential for cross resistance. So if we have a huge population of beetles that is resistant to one trait, and a new trait comes in, and it's marketed as a new trait, but physiologically, biochemi biochemically, it's kind of similar to the one that was there before, it's not gonna be six, seven years before the beetles develop resistance to that one. It's gonna be much faster. So we've gotta think a little bit broader, a little bit long, more, more, uh, long term, and alternate, rotate both crops, rotate management strategies, rotate chemistry. So rotation is, I think, the best word in IPM.